And I was in the room face to face with people telling me it was impossible. And now as I sit here with you today, it's everywhere. And I've lived through that whole transition and I've seen how impossible ideas turn into probable ideas, turn into possible ideas, turn into real ideas, turn into everyday items. Now today it's like non-thinking. Before any world-changing innovation, there was a moment, an event, a realization that sparked the idea. Before It Happened is a show about that idea. Each week, we take a deep dive into a singular light bulb moment that inspired the visionaries to push forward and change our lives. I'm your host, Donna Laughlin. Nearly 20 years ago, I launched a public relations firm with the sole purpose of helping visionaries tell their stories to the world. Now, two decades later, I want to share those stories and more with you. This podcast takes you on a journey before it happened with the innovators who imagine and are still imagining the future. Ever since I was a child, I was curious about so many things. I spent hours in the garage at science fairs, sifting through popular science, popular mechanics, and pretty much any journal I could get my hands on, exploring and discovering how things work. From transportation and AI to just about anything you can put in your home, office, or pocket. On this show, you'll hear from the innovators themselves as they tell their stories of how they brought those visions to life. Grab your passport and let's go on a journey together. Do you remember the first time you took a digital photograph? Think back for a second. Depending on your age, it could have been as recently as yesterday or as long ago as 20 or maybe even 25 years ago. But no matter how old you are, it couldn't have been any earlier than 1989, the year the first digital camera hit the market. That is, unless you're Steve Sasson, who is my guest today. Steve, it turns out, was the first person on planet Earth to capture a digital photographic image all the way back in 1975. And what's more, it was a prototype digital camera that he developed himself as a young, fresh out of college engineer with the Eastman Kodak Company. But I'm getting ahead of myself. My conversation with Steve is a fascinating look at a time when young engineers were given free reign to tinker around and see what they could come up with. In Steve's case, what he built would change the world. He just had to wait years to see it happen. It's easy to forget that for almost a century, Kodak was one of the most important companies in America, and maybe even the world. Kodak dominated the photography industry for decades. Their film-based business model was impenetrable. You bought their cameras, you used their films, and your pictures were developed and printed on their paper. But then came digital. When film started to become obsolete in the late 1990s and early 2000s, Kodak was caught flat-footed, despite having been sitting on Steve Sesson's invention for more than a decade. For Steve, the digital camera was one of the very first projects he worked on at Kodak. He wasn't even asked to build a camera. He just needed to find a use for a new piece of tech called a charged coupling device. And he was thrilled to take on the challenge, Steve grew up in Brooklyn, New York, fascinated with electronics. He and his brothers, who would all become engineers themselves, would scour the streets of Brooklyn's Bay Ridge neighborhood, looking for old electronic devices that they could take apart, build back up, or use as a base for something new altogether. I got my parts because I lived in Brooklyn. and It was a very densely populated area. So when people got their TV set broke or their radio or stereo broke, they would put it out on the curb for the garbage men to come and pick it up. And I would wander around the neighborhood and find these things and drag them home and do autopsies on them, basically. And I would salvage all these parts from them, tubes, largely, capacitors, resistors, transformers, stuff like that. And then I would build my projects using that. So it was kind of a 
a very low cost hobby for me. And I was just lucky to be in an environment where I could get all of those parts to do it. That's great. Well, that's called upcycling now, <laughs> right? So I put okay. out the street and it's finders keepers. And so this was pre kind of buying hobby kits. Like you created your own hobby kits, basically. Yeah, I did. I, you know, you built all this stuff from those parts. I also, I lived in New York City and there was a place in New York City. It was called Radio Row. It was down by VZ Street where the World Trade Center used to be. And it was a army surplus kind of a place. And you would take a subway down there. So for all of the parts that I couldn't get off of the consumer products I was taking apart, I would go down there and buy them on usually large capacitors or certain tubes and things. So I would go down to Radio Row and, and buy those parts that way too. So I was doubly lucky in terms of where I was to be able to get all of these parts. And I used to build all of these things, stereos, and I became a ham radio operator when I was about 13. And then I started annoying all the neighbors by transmitting my transmitter and disrupting the television sets. That was a whole problem with that. But that kind of thing, that's kind of what I was doing at the time. Let's talk about school. So you're in school and you're building all these things at home. What were you building and what was fascinating you at, at school? What kept your interest in school? Well, you know, New York City has an interesting school system. They have a very good school system. And I went to my local grammar school, and then I went to a junior high school where I took the bus to school. But then when I got into ninth grade, you had the option, anybody in New York City had the option of taking a competitive test to get into one of the specialized schools in New York City. And there were a number of them. And the, the school that I was interested in, because of the technology I was spending my time with, was Brooklyn Technical High School. And it was a school in another part of Brooklyn, and it encouraged people with uh, technological interests to go there. And it was, you had to take this test, and if you passed this test or you got a good enough grade, they would allow you to go there. And if you, for some reason, didn't keep up your grades, this set of schools, and there were several others, there was the Bronx High School of Science, and of course, there was Stuyvesant in Manhattan, they could actually send you back to your local high school not for behavioral reasons, but for academic reasons. And they were the only schools that were allowed to do that. So it was a, it was sort of an elevated educational environment. And so I got a chance to not only go to school with kids from all over New York City that had interests in technology, but also get to deal with some really good teachers. And what year was, was that? That was 1964. I went as a freshman, graduated in 1968. So those were the years that I was going to Brooklyn Technical High School. And it was a great school. It was actually a very large school. It was probably the, the largest, what they called single session school in the whole United States. There were over 6,000 kids in this school at one time. My graduating class was like 1,200 or something like that. You know, So it was a very, very large school. But the vast majority of the kids who graduated from there every year went on to college. Uh, very prestigious colleges, many of them. So so it was a very good school, was academically demanding, but they had a lot of shops and technical drawings. I took subjects that you probably typically wouldn't take in a normal school. Such as? Well, I took like four years of technical drawing, which I can't even to this day imagine why I needed four years of technical drawing. But you did that. It took, you know, four years of math, lots of shop foundry, machine shops, things like that. So I, I got exposed to a lot of the technology of the day, not as much electronics as I would have liked, but some. And so it was the right school for me at the right time. And where did you go to college? Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. It was a school up in Troy, New York. It's an engineering school. It was the oldest engineering school in the United States. It was one of the, the first one ever established. And it's got some famous graduates like uh, Roebling, who he, he was the person who built the Brooklyn Bridge, which was one of the big technological marvels of its day. He graduated from RPI. And so it was a very well-known and established school. It was in New York State. And I had a state scholarship, so you could get a scholarship from the state to go to any school in the state. So it was kind of an incentive for me to stay in New York State, but I did want to get out of New York City. My brother went to school in Manhattan, and we, I grew up in Brooklyn, so I didn't really want to. So I kind of liked the idea of going to a really good school, but outside the city. And so it was just up near, near Albany, New York. But the thing I remember the most was that the professors I had were just outstanding. I had very good teachers in my high school. 
I think they were some of the best uh, teachers in New York City. But boy, when I went to college, I got some of the best teachers I literally in the world. My first recitation session in physics as a freshman, first semester freshman, was with a fellow named Robert Resnick. Now, I don't know if your listeners would know this name, but he and another person wrote a very famous textbook that was used all over the world for freshman physics. And to be in a single session with 12 kids in the class and Robert Resnick was something when I look back on it saying, wow, how did I get that lucky? I mean, he was so good. He would come in and they inspired me. He was so good. I tell this one story because it was just one of those things that just was really inspiring to me at the time. I would try to do the homework that would let, give us two lectures during the week. And then we would meet on Thursday or Friday with the recitation session. And all Resnick would do would walk in with no books or notes or anything. And he'd say, well, what problems did you have with the homework? And of course, I had spent several hours trying to do all these equations and get the answer. And sometimes I would, but many times I wouldn't. And you'd ask him and he would, without notes, without anything, he would just say, read me the problem. And in like three or four lines, he would go from, you know, a fundamental equation, physics, F equals MA, let's say. And in three lines, he would just say, what do you know? What do you don't know? He taught me how to solve problems. And it was like being on the basketball court with Michael Jordan. You're, you're watching right in front of you, it being done. And you just tried to do this a hundred times. And this guy just made it look so easy. So he taught me how to go to basic principles and to ask simple questions and keep reminding yourself what you're looking for and the answer is and and what the form it might take. And he was just very inspiring. Now, he was just one of many teachers that I had that were very inspiring to me. So I was, I look fondly back at the education I got at Rensselaer. Oh, I love the comparison to Michael Jordan because I, I do think educators and school teachers are oftentimes the heroes, right? That help us push us to the next level. And and you just shared is, you know, is really pushing you and helping you amplify your cognitive skills, right? Yes. Which are huge. So let's talk. So you get out of college and you're getting ready to college. And what was the job prospects and job opportunities for you? So I graduated in 1973. And by that time, a lot of the luster had gone off of the all the excitement on the space race. So there was a lot of less interested in electronics and communication and that kind of stuff. And so the job prospects sort of changed. And I did interview at a number of places that traditionally you would think an electrical engineer would interview with in 1973, such as Hewlett Packard in Boston and General Electric in Pittsfield and uh, things. But I went and I interviewed at Eastman Kodak Company, which was not traditionally hiring a lot of electrical engineers. And you certainly wouldn't have thought of Kodak if you were an electronics guy, right? You just didn't, they just didn't sort of go together. But at the time, because a lot of the unit manufacturing costs and design time was devoted to the electrical portion of cameras, film advance, exposure control, flashes, things like that, They were starting to hire more electrical engineers. Traditionally, they hired chemical engineers and mechanical engineers because cameras were mechanical, you know, largely. So I interviewed there and and, and I saw a number of places in the company, but the one that interested me the most was a place called the Apparatus Division Research Laboratory. And it was the place where they did applied research for all of the equipment that used the sensitized goods that was the main business of Eastman Kodak Company. And at the end of the day of my interviews, they asked me which one I liked. I said that this place, the apparatus division, seemed really interesting. And it was. They let me go work there. So I was lucky there, too. And it was a very interesting place. It was a relatively small lab, probably about 60, 70 people in it at tops. But they had all different disciplines. And I hired into what was called the electronics group. But there was a mechanics group. There was a math group. There was a physics group. There was a systems group. And these were all people that would had different disciplines. And they would get together and work on particular problems that were presented by the design and development community at large that were making the printers and the cameras and projectors and all the other equipment that was uh, being made by Kodak at the time. Two questions. What was your earliest memory of, of Kodak as a child growing up? Were you aware of the Kodak name and was it already a, a branded? I was aware of Kodak, of course. Kodak was 
probably one of the most famous companies in the world. I mean, it was just very well known, had a very good name. People liked it. But I wasn't terribly interested in photography as such. I was interested in electronics. And they were, at that time, now today, of course, people listening to this are saying, well, what are you talking about? Photography is electronics, right? Well, no, back then they were completely separate. I mean, photography was the application of a sensitized film in a camera to grab an exposure, right? And then you would chemically develop it and then you would optically either, you know, print it or whatever. There was no really electronics associated with it. There might be some in the camera that help you make a proper exposure, but that was about it. So I really didn't have a great interest in photography or the company. I went there because of the people I met and the technologies they were applying interested me. I, I love the interdisciplinary nature of it. Some of the other places I interviewed were more defense oriented. And so you'd be surrounded by 30 people that were just like you. And what interested me here was I was sitting next to a mathematician, you know, or a mechanical engineer. And it was a very much a much more diverse environment, at least, you know, a technical background diverse. So yeah, and just that period of time, it's like this is pre Silicon Valley. So the technological boom wasn't happening in HP was existed, right? In the Valley and California, it was a lot of the defense companies, Food Machinery Corp and places like that. But Kodak, you know, probably had 80% of the market, if not more, you know, back in this period of time. So let's talk about silicone. You mentioned silicone. So why silicone? And then did that directly correlate to this particular lab group? Yeah, my interest in how, how light affected silicon was something that started in college. And I just liked the idea that I could take a beam of light or an exposure of some kind and then control the flow of current. I just thought that was cool. I'm not sure why I thought that was cool, but I did. It was something Star Trek about it, you know? I mean, it, it was... It was a, and so I, I did a master's project where I, I wrote to GE in Pittsfield and I said, I'd like to build a motor that controls the flow of current in the rotating armature by optical pulses. And I'd like to use an optically controlled thyristor, which is just basically a switch, but it would be controlled by light instead of an electrical pulse. And they got interested. They actually sent me a whole bunch of parts. And you'll, you'll see a theme here, by the way. Remember I told you about Brooklyn where I went around and scrounged parts? Well, I scrounged parts in college as well. And I also begged GE to send me free parts, which they did. And I built this thing, and that was my master's project. Oh, that's great. So now that you're at Kodak, are you still in parts too? Are you scrounging for parts in the lab? Actually, when we talk about the development of the first digital camera, that was exactly what I did. You know, the camera idea happened soon after I got there. I had done a couple of projects making control logic uh, using what's called SSI logic, which was just small chips that would do logic gates to control a machine that was molding glass lenses and cleaning lenses. So I learned that part of it. And then one day my supervisor, his name was Gareth Lloyd, another lucky thing for me, had to be working for a guy like him. He came in and he said, well, you know, I've, I've got two projects, sort of filler projects for you until something useful comes along. One was to do exposure control modeling for an XL movie camera. And I wasn't terribly interested in that, but he said, but there's a new type of optical device called a charge couple device. I wonder if you want to get one of those and see if we can do anything useful with it. Conversation, like I said, lasted about 45 seconds. It's funny. I remember he was leaning against the file cabinet in my office and just said, well, I'm interested in that. Why? Because at RPI, I had done something like that, but I had never seen anything like a charge couple device before. So I was predisposed to work with light again to see what I could do with it. And uh, that was about the extent of the direction I got on it. No, nobody told me to build a camera or anything like that, but he told me to evaluate it. So the best way to evaluate it, one is to get it to work, which was a bit of a challenge because they were very weird and very new devices. And they had just been started to have been produced. You must have been thrilled though to think, oh my gosh, I'm getting paid to do this. Like, yes, I just get to think out of the box and solve. You've been doing this your whole life and now you're getting paid to do it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for saying that because that's exactly how I felt. I couldn't believe my luck. Uh, you know, they're paying me to do this stuff. I mean, this is just really cool. And, you know, I really uh, overextended the, the project, of course. I basically decided to try to build a camera because 
This device was a chip that, if you did an exposure on it, would create a corresponding charge pattern that mimicked the exposure that you, that's the light exposure. And then it would uh, allow you to clock this off of in a sequence so that you could reassemble it. And then I thought if I digitized the output, I could measure the output. And then I said, the best way to measure is to store it. So now I'm storing a charge pattern that corresponded to the light pattern. So I kind of have a camera. So I decided to try to build a camera and I tried to decide to build one with no moving parts. That last part was just me trying to annoy the mechanical engineers because they used to make fun of me because every time I needed a mechanical part, I'd have to go to them and I wouldn't know how to do any of that stuff, you know? So I started doing this and Gareth Lloyd, my supervisor, he was probably the only person I spoke to during the time I was doing this and he encouraged me, but I had no budget to go and buy stuff. So let's go back to the scrounging part of my life. I walked, you know, I was working at Eastman Kodak Company. It was actually a giant factory where they manufactured all of this stuff. So when you wandered around, if you knew the right people or you were quick enough with your hands, you could come up with a lot of cool parts. And that's exactly what I did. I was decided to build a camera. In order to build a camera, I needed a lens system. Well, I couldn't build a lens, but I saw that they were designing lenses and lens assemblies for XL movie cameras right underneath my laboratory in the factory downstairs. And they had a used parts bin. So I just wandered down there one day and lifted one of those assemblies out there and brought that back up and used that in my camera. You know, that's the kind of thing I was doing. So I was just what I kind of did in Brooklyn. I was doing inside a Kodak, borrowing parts. Did you actually have like an infinite goal of knowing so you're going to create this camera, but did you actually have a goal exactly what it was going to do? Or were you just in this continuous exploratory process? And what period of time were you talking about? Were you in like, you know, a, a couple of years here? Or what? what's the period of time from the, that you said, I'm going to create this camera? Gareth and I had our first discussion probably in late 1974. And during the year of 1975, I worked on this. I had other jobs too, but I had did this in a laboratory. And by the way, I want to mention, I, I had the help of two enormously talented technicians. One fellow named Bob Diego, who helped configure the mechanical nature of the, the camera that I built, which turned out to be incredibly useful because it was a real prototype. I had to take everything apart all the time and this allowed me to do it. And the other one was a fellow named Jim Schickler, who was just an enormously talented guy. And he worked with me shoulder to shoulder in the laboratory as we built and debugged each one of the parts. But it took us about a year, the year of 1975, to assemble the parts and build them. It was only until December of 1975 when we felt we had everything working. So it was a whole year of let's get this part working, get that part working, get that part working. And then, you know, it was like this one moment we said we should take a picture of something. And that's kind of an interesting little story as well. Describe that moment. The first time you saw something and what was that? What did you actually take a picture of? Uh, well, it was it was interesting. We we're in a laboratory and we Jim and I used to take pictures of a white cardboard, which is black on one side and white on the other. And that way I could look on the oscilloscope and see the output of the device and what was stored in memory. And I could see, you know, zeros for the digital word representing the pixels for the black portion. And, and so every line repeated. So it was easy to see. But then we said, we got to take a picture of something that's real, right? So we were working in this laboratory. I had no idea. So I just, I, I folded up the camera. The camera was unfolded most of the time. But I folded it up and I walked down the hallway and there was a, a young girl. Her name was uh, Joy Marshall at the time. And she was sitting at a teletype. And I asked if I could take her picture head and shoulders shot of her. And um, she knew us as the, you know, the strange guys at the end of the hallway. So I did that. I took a shot. The picture was captured in 50 milliseconds, but it took about 23 seconds to record it from the temporary memory in the camera to the, the Philips cassette that held it permanently. So the tape would start to move. That's how I knew I'd captured an image. So the tape started moving. I walked back to the laboratory and took the tape out when it was done recording, put it in our playback unit, which would do the opposite of the camera, would read the tape off into the computer and then would reconfigure the image so it would be presentable on a television set because a television set has a lot more lines than I captured in my image. I only had 100 lines on the imager and 400 lines or so displayed on the TV set. So we had to do interpolation and all that kind of stuff. So all of that stuff we had had to do as well. And all of that was being experimentally developed at the same time. So what popped up on the picture was you could see the background, you could see her head her long hair, she had shoulder length hair, but her face was complete static, totally unrecognizable. And Jim and I were looking at this and we were so overjoyed. We had never seen the whole system work before. And we knew a thousand reasons why nothing would show up. 
I mean, I just think of all the reasons why nothing would show. But yet this showed up in the it was that pictures were aligned. The pixels were in the right place. And so we were overjoyed. I remember telling Jim, boy, so much is working. This is fantastic. And Jim says, yeah, that's great. Well, meanwhile, Joy had followed me back to the laboratory, was standing in the doorway. And we turned around, we saw her and she saw this picture of her up there and she looked like a monster, right? And uh, she said to us, needs work and turned around and left. And so it was just ma- didn't make any sense. It took us about an hour to figure out what that was. I rewired it, and then we saw our first picture. And that was in December of 1975. Was the, the second picture then, Joy, again? Did she come back into the lab? or I just redid the picture I took. You know, <laughs> getting this thing to work was like, wow, if it worked once, let's just sit with it right now and don't disturb it. Right? Has, has that picture been published? No, I, I had no way of saving this. A lot of people ask me that, and I have to take you back to the environment. Nobody told me to build this camera. If you ask the management of the laboratory what assassin doing, they wouldn't know. Lloyd would know. My supervisor would know. Well, actually, it was, and when I discussed it with him, I discussed it in terms of particular parts of the circuit working, you know, not the whole system. And so I remember that day, I was so excited that it was working. I went into his office, interrupted him and told him, you know, my camera's working. I just took my first picture. And he says, well, that's terrific. He said, Will, let's bring in some of the management of the lab and show it to him. We'll bring him in the lab. As excited as Steve and his team were about what they had built, the reaction he got from Kodak's management was a bit disappointing. Steve thought he had just discovered the future of photography. And today, we obviously know he was right. But in 1975, Kodak wasn't interested in the future of photography. They controlled 70% of the film market in the United States. Why would they want to compete against themselves? So they decided to sit on the technology Steve had developed. It was a decision that would come back to haunt the company in the decades that followed. Well, if I were a Kodak executive, (laughs) the first thing I would ask was, there's no film. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Kodak is a huge part of the revenue is film. That subject came up. Yeah. That was discussed. There were two two issues that always came up when that discussion took place. One is, I don't want to give any impression that Kodak is abandoning film because we didn't want people to not buy film. Okay, so you don't even want to give a hint kind of thing. Second thing is, is that people look to Kodak to be the basically the advisor on how to take pictures. So we didn't want to ever suggest that a technology to take pictures would be acceptable. It was digital. It was expensive, esoteric. Nobody understood it. And so I had to use analogies. I used uh, calculators were just coming out. Engineers were buying calculators. So I said, think of it as potentially a calculator with a lens. That was a consumer product. If you consider engineers consumers, they were buying calculators. So I could see how a lens and an imager could be incorporated with a calculator. And you could think about it as a consumer product. Steve, you're a rebel because you think about it. If you're in this really traditional company, and I imagine everyone wearing suit and tie, are you in a suit and tie or you were in a lab coat? No, like- it was terrible. I I remember, and this 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 might make you laugh, but I remember I didn't even own a watch. And uh, I used to go in and one of the groups of people I demonstrated the camera to were patent lawyers. They wanted the patent department to look at it. And I remember when I walked in, all of those guys, they had suits and ties on and they had watches. And I said, oh, my God, these guys are like serious. Right. So I did my little demonstration and they wrote me a letter afterwards saying I should write up an invention disclosure because they're thinking of applying for a patent on the concept. They weren't sure if they would. They didn't think they would use it, but they may. And I have this letter to this day because not because it was the first letter about digital photography which it turns out it was, I guess. But it was because I had never gotten a letter from a lawyer before who who had watches and, and t- suits and ties. <laughs> so, I mean, that's kind of where I was. I was. I was a lab person that was building stuff, just like I did in Brooklyn or I did at RPI. And I just built this system and I just threw it out there. And then I got all this pushback, which I was woefully unprepared for. They asked me like the photo finishing the whole photo finishing infrastructure around the world was a bunch of photo stores that you would bring your film to. You would buy your film there. Actually, it was it was a brilliant, brilliant economic model. Think about it. When you were involved with a photographic experience, you would take one trip to the photo store on your corner to buy your film. Then when you exposed the film, you would bring it back to that same photo store, second exposure to the store, 
And then the third time was when you picked up your prints. Three customer exposures for every photographic experience. So there was a lot of pushback in terms of, from a customer perspective, the customers are not asking for this. And from a business perspective, what's a business model here? You know, how do we make money at this? How do we help the consumer and and stay in business with this? And I didn't have answers for either one. So how long did it take from the time that you did this demonstration and you did the patent? Did Kodak realize, oh, this could be marketable? Well, the patent, they applied for a patent and it was issued in 1978. And then when the patent was issued, it became public. And I did get some phone calls about it because it was just, it was called an all electronic steel camera. And underneath it was, you know, assigned by Eastman Kodak Company. So it was, if you were just a general patent watcher, it was an unusual combination because they saw it was all electronic and Kodak, right? So they called me because my name was on the patent and I didn't know what to do. So I talked to the public relations department and they said, do not talk about this at all. If you have any calls like this, send them to us, you know, the public relations department. So I didn't speak publicly about any of the work I just described to you until 2001. I mean, it's not unusual. You you don't talk about research projects inside of corporations. That's not unusual. But this one, they were a little more sensitive about. And so I didn't uh, talk about it until they asked me to in 2001, because at that time, digital cameras were really starting to take off as consumer items. And it was helpful to have Kodak be the inventor of this technology. So what other digital things were happening around you that maybe weren't a camera? Other popular consumer products beginning to pop up, like the digital clock and things like that? Yeah, there were many things happening from an electronics point of view, especially from a tinkerer's point of view. It was very exciting time. The thing was that the rest of the world was inventing along with me, right? I mean, there were people were developing microprocessors at a tremendous rate. Digital memory was also progressing along very well. Different forms of memory, non volatile memory and stuff like that. Certainly the algorithms so during the whole 19, less of the 1970s and throughout the 1980s, I worked on different pieces of the technology. And so didn't build another whole camera until 1989, which was a DSLR. Fuji would ultimately bring the first digital camera to market in the late 1980s. But at that time, Kodak wasn't worried about who was first. They were more concerned with who had the best technology. I would say in the 1980s, we were watching everybody and a lot of companies that you probably wouldn't know today were working on different elements of this. We were very concerned about image compression. We knew that the resolution had to get up much higher than the imagers were presently at the time. So we were we were like aiming where we, he needed to be rather than where the puck was at the time. We knew Fuji was working on it, but the very first cameras were, we knew they would never sell. I mean, they were technical curiosities. If you really wanted to solve the problem of photography, you had to be as good as film was, at least at some point. And um, we knew we had to get there. For these, did you end up having the competitive products in your lab that you took them apart? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Well, I would say the story doesn't end in the 1990s. At the 1990s, we started actually producing cameras for photojournalists. Well, first, we produced a few of them for the military because they had a special need for cameras. They could take pictures and send pictures back. And they were the only people who could afford these cameras. These cameras now were like $25,000 each you know, kind of thing. So, But we quickly went to using Nikon camera bodies. The company developed cameras using our imaging chips that we developed. We hollowed out the camera bodies from Nikon and we built those cameras and we gave those to um, photojournalists because they would take pictures that were reasonably good. Again, nowhere near an ectochrome, a Kodachrome negative, maybe like 1.5 megapixels, but they were good enough for doing publishing in newspapers and some magazines. And it would allow photojournalists to get their pictures back to their publisher right away. And so they would pay the extra money and deal with the inconvenience and the weirdness of these cameras in order to have that one ability. And so that's how we started getting into the business. So you shared with me, you were in Yellowstone National Park on a family vacation, and you looked around and you saw people taking photos with digital camera. Can you share that moment again? Yeah, we were talking about, there's like your professional life and your personal life, right? And, you know, I had worked on digital photography my whole life inside the company, but I didn't really talk to too many people, certainly about it outside the company. Not because it was so secret, it's just because nobody was terribly interested, you know. But I've worked on this idea since 1975. 
And it was, I was taking a trip. We were in Yellowstone uh, at Old Faithful, uh, the geyser that erupts periodically. We were at that site and they have a big, they had a big clock out there that would count down to the next eruption because it was pretty regularly scheduled. And so there was a whole bunch of benches that surrounded at a distance, the opening to the geyser. And so people would sit on the bench and go sort of get ready for the big, the big thing. And so I sat there with my my wife, Cindy, and our two kids were playing somewhere else. And I saw all these people getting their cameras ready. And some of them were film cameras. Some of them were still video floppy cameras, the, the Mavica kind of approach. And then there were many digital cameras. This was about 1998. And I said to Cindy, I said, it's happening. And she said, what's happening? And I says, well, and then I told her how I had developed this first digital camera. And, and then I'd thought about this a lot, you know, and all the technology and stuff. But now I'm sort of on vacation with my family. So I'm in my like real life, you know, and you actually see it happening. And it was like a, like a real moment for me, you know, it was like, wow, you know, (laughs) I thought about this so many years ago and now it's like really happening in like real life. These are real people taking really pictures that they value with this thing, you know? And so it was like, I was just sort of startled at, uh, sort of the reality of this vision that, you know, I had lived with for so many years. By the early 2000s, Steve had been with Kodak for more than 25 years, and he'd spent pretty much all that time in the lab. But once the digital camera market started to heat up, Kodak realized that he could be useful in a different way. They had a built-in competitive advantage that no one else had. Kodak had been the first company to develop the technology that allowed the digital photography boom to happen. So all of a sudden, the decades-old gag order on the digital camera project was lifted, and they wanted Steve to be the public face. The company went from sort of not talking about digital photography development to talking about it a lot because it was now an advantage. We were competing with Sony and Nikon and everybody else selling digital cameras to consumers. And so they realized now that they had invented the digital camera. We had the first patent. We had the prototype. And they asked me, they heard that I had my original prototype. I mean, the original camera that I took my first pictures with. Now, I shouldn't have kept that camera because it was an R&D expense and you're supposed to get rid of those things. But, you know, it's just too cool a thing to get rid of. I kept it in my drawer and in my file cabinet over the years. So I actually remember calling public relations They wanted to take a picture. The local newspaper wanted to take a picture of me with this camera. And I called the public relations and says, is this okay? Because, you know, for the last 25 years, you know, you didn't want me talking about this. I didn't really want to get into it because I shouldn't have had the camera to begin with. But, you know, felt I should ask it. And they said, oh, no, we would like to talk about this now. So I went from never talking about it to talking about it. (laughs) It was just bizarre, you know. So they took this picture. It was taken in October of 2001. And it was just me holding the camera. It was the first time the camera was spoken about, was seen by the public, and I told the story. So at that point, then they started asking me to go out and talk in public about it because it was helpful for the company, because any way you could differentiate yourself from the competition. And Kodak wasn't considered to be an electronics company by the general public. So telling the story about how you developed the digital camera before anybody else was helpful for the company in terms of establishing a reputation. So they sent me to public relations school down in New York City, Ketchum. I went there and I went on several road trips, traveled throughout Asia, interviewing, did radio shows, television shows. I went from being, you know, a lab guy to being a public relations guy. That's quite a transition, right? The wizard. You came out from behind the curtain. Well, it, but, you know, I, and you know this, you know this, you were a reporter, you dealt with this. You know how dealing with the public and the press is an art form. I mean, it really is. You have to stick to the message and understand what the reporter wants. And so they taught me how to do all of this kind of thing. So I was in the middle of doing that. And then I was asked to actually go and help with patent litigation. Again, I have I have many patents to my name, but I really don't pay attention to the patents once they're issued. You know, it's just a piece of paper. But it turns out that the history of Kodak was not When we were in the conventional photographic business, there was not much patent litigation involved. It was a very polite business. There were a few big players in the business, right? Fuji, Agfa. And when we had an issue, it seemed like you would just get together over coffee and you would settle it. There was no 
big litigation. But when the digital photography era came, there was a hundred different people in this field. And they came to us in the late 90s. I think it was Hitachi that came to us and said, hey, you owe us money. You know, we were now making digital cameras and selling them. You owe us money because, you know, we have patents. And then Kodak said, well, we're not used to this. But and we looked at our patents and said, we've got patents. By the end of the week, they ended up paying Kodak. I mean, it was, you know, we, we had done some really fundamental work, but we never really looked at it that carefully. So then we started thinking about how we might be able to defend our company from other people. So defensive position, and then also a licensing opportunity. So an offensive position. And so it was in 2004 or so, I was asked to go over and head up, a, be a project manager for patent litigation. It turns out we were dealing with Sony at the time. And I, of course, knew nothing about this. I had managed big projects before, and I had some, obviously, some experience with the technology involved with the patent litigation. And one of my patents was actually in this suit. So I was probably a, a reasonable choice for it, but I certainly didn't have any experience in dealing with patent lawyers and licensing. So that was a whole nother turn that I got involved with. And uh, I w- did that uh, for several years. Ended up testifying a number of times in the International Trade Commission on behalf of Kodak, you know, against uh, some you know major players in the uh, in the photographic world and in the cell phone world. So it was a very interesting last ten years of my career. <laughs> I'll say that. And Apple was one of those players too, right? Oh yeah, Apple, Samsung, all of those. They were all involved in different patent licensing negotiations and eventually litigations. Uh, that took place in the in the decade of 2000 to 2010 or so. And we were involved with that. Kodak was reasonably successful in licensing. We, we did very well, actually. I don't know the exact numbers, but well worth the expense. And there was a lot of expense. So, Do you think Kodak would have, if they had followed suit with the digital camera and market sooner, that they could have avoided bankruptcy in 2012? I don't know. It's a hard question to answer because... One, the photographic business model of film and paper was such a great business model. I don't think it would surprise you when I say that photographic film was probably one of the most profitable consumer products ever conceived by man. I mean, it was just very profitable. It had a very high economic moat around the business. It was very hard to get into the business, so you didn't have many competitors. And it existed for a long period of time, and it was quite adequate for the task. Consumers weren't asking for anything more. They had a very convenient, economic, and reliable way of capturing personal images. And so when you suggested a new way of doing it, you also had to come up with a business model and anything you could come up with couldn't even come close. So there was that challenge inside the company. It must have been hard to pierce through that kind of culture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a very hard question to answer because all companies have cultures. And if I were to describe the culture inside a Kodak, I would say it was a very polite culture. All right? I would say that, you know, you didn't argue openly with people too much and things like that. It wasn't a cruel culture. And I think in order to make the transition that you would have had to have made in order to make this massive move, and it was massive, you would have had to have a different kind of a culture. Uh, it would have had to have been a lot more severe, I would think. So that's one thing I would say. I would also say that depending on the pace of change that's affecting your discontinuity. Codex discontinuity really happened over 10 to 15 years. I would say from 1990, when we built Ecamm, you know, half a dozen guys built a digital camera. What could the rest of the world do, right? But so between 1990, let's say, and 2005, when digital photography basically displaced film photography in the average consumer's eyes, a major effort of that, that was 15 years. So what do you do with 15 years? And how do you take your existing business unit that is generating lots of cash and judiciously apply it? So you, you want to keep your existing business going. I'm hard pressed to see many examples where long established companies that are very successful can make that kind of a transition. And depending upon the time in which you wanted to make this move, Kodak would have had to do different things. At times they had the money, but they didn't have the interest. At times they had the interest and didn't have the money. And there were other times when they kind of had neither. What are your thoughts now when you look at the digital camera? And, you know, what do you you used to have these these moments where you're just like, I was part of, I led this movement. I honestly don't think about it much. When I do think about it, I think about how lucky I was. I just happened to be at the right place 
at the right time with the right interest set and set of skills to do this. I would tell you that if I hadn't been able to make the contribution I did in in, in 1975, somebody else would have done it soon after probably. It probably would have been a Kodak too, because there were just so many smart people there interested in this topic. So in that regard, when I think about it, I think I'm kind of the luckiest person in the world. Not not only because of, you know, I was able to contribute, but because I was able to witness this whole development. I was in the room face to face with people telling me it was impossible. And now as I sit here with you today, it's everywhere. And I've lived through that whole transition and I've seen how impossible ideas turn into probable ideas, turn into possible ideas, turn into real ideas, turn into everyday items. Now, today, it's like non-thinking, you know? So when I see that, you know, and it took most of my working life to experience it, but I got a chance to see it. And it's a... So when I when I hear people talk about some of the new technologies today and how that may never happen or whatever, I said, yeah, I kind of seen something that I heard the same thing years ago. That was Steve Sasson. In addition to the digital camera, you could say that he's responsible for another major cultural development of the 21st century, the selfie. He says it's something he gets asked about a lot. It never occurred to him while he was working on his eight pound prototype digital camera that people might someday decide to turn it around and snap a picture of themselves. It also never occurred to him that someday there would be a company with the idea to put a digital camera inside a phone that would fit into the palm of your hand. But Steve says the selfie is a great example of how unpredictable innovation can be. He says engineers and scientists can never really know in the moment how society might decide to use or interpret new technology in the future. Before It Happened is produced by me, Donna Laughlin, along with Studio Pod Media. The executive producer is Katie Sunku Wood, and all episodes are written and developed by Jack Buer. Our show coordinator is Deanna Morency, with additional editing and music provided by Nota Lab.